Okay, well, it is four o'clock straight up, so I'd like to welcome you all here. We have, it's really nice to be in person. We're also live streaming, um, so we may take some questions that are coming in from the sky somewhere and address those, but we will repeat them, and we will re be repeating the questions that you ask here so that the live streaming folks at home can see that as well. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being interested in coming to learn a little bit about third-line therapies in overactive bladder. I think every year we're all getting a little better at it, and the technology continues to advance and improve, so it's a really exciting time to be taking care of a refractory overactive bladder. This is the three of us that you see up here and our uh, uh, conflicts of interest or our disclosures. So now, first of all, I'd like to please ask everybody to sign on to poll everywhere because we will have a couple of audience response sort of pre-test questions, pre-program uh, pre questions. So if you could take out your phone and go ahead and sign on to pollev.com forward slash AUA meeting 818. Oh, and or you can actually text that AUA meeting 818 to 22333. Yes, the live streaming folks can do it too, so you can feel like you're here. All right, I'll give you a minute just to catch up to that. Dr. Vasavita is reminding me that if you have a question, please go to the mic so that they can all hear it at home as well. Okay, so we're gonna do a test question just to see if we have all successfully signed on. And as you can see, the question is, what do you love most about New Orleans? AUA 20, 2022, of course, Creole and Cajun food, Bourbon Street, or the French Quarter? Only got four people have answered so far. Okay, so if I push the next button, it's going to show me the poll. Is that what? Oh, when I go forward, it goes to pretest like that. But all right, well, we will go ahead and go for the pretest here. This is going to be the question, and we'll go to the poll in a second. So a 57-year-old female desires to undergo PTNS for her refractory OAB symptoms. She wants to know which is a contraindication to this therapy. So it's A, history of unilateral below the knee amputation, B, history of cardiac pacemaker, C, prior intradetrusor on a botulinum toxin injection, D, history of cognitive dysfunction, or E, aspirin therapy. So if I go to here, we'll be able to see everybody's answers. Pretest two, a 61-year-old woman with overactive bladder is undergoing posterior tibial nerve stimulation weekly. She's on her fourth week and feels minimal clinical benefit so far. Her urinalysis is negative and post void residual is 65 cc's. The next step is A, continue her PTNS weekly, B, increase the amplitude of her stimulation, C, change PTNS to the contralateral foot, D, change to sacral neuromodulation, and E, add on a botulinum toxin A injections. Not sure why it's not showing us the bars as they get answered, but there is, the N is small, so that's perhaps the reason. It should show, though, wouldn't it? Doesn't it? There we go. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Yes, that's why I'm not giving them the answers, but this is good, and I'm glad you're thinking about this. So a 61-year-old woman with overactive bladder is undergoing posterior tubule nerve stimulation. Uh, this is the same question. So let's go, uh, isn't it? Same, same concept. Uh, so a 39-year-old man with refractory OAB is undergoing sacral neuromodulation lead placement. 
Stimulation of a secret needle placed in his low back elicits bellows only. The next step is move the needle down one level, move the needle up one level, increase the frequency, turn up the stimulation, or decrease the pulse width. Again, I don't know how to make the bars show up, but. Okay. A 46 year old woman has refractory OAB. She's interested in undergoing onobotulinum toxin A injections for the bladder, but is also receiving onobotulinum toxin for migraines. The next step is increase her anticholinergics. Onobotulinum toxin A is not an option for her. Proceed with 50 units, proceed with 100 units. Before bladder injection, check with her neurologist to ensure she would not exceed 400 units in three months. Okay. All right, and I think there's one more pretest question. A 60 year old man has done well with sacral neuromodulation for his non obstructed OEB for five years. He presents after a fall skiing, describing that his OEB symptoms have returned. He's on program one, and impedances are greater than 4,000 ohms in electrode zero and one, and 500 ohms in leads two and three. The next step is increase amplitude, change the battery. Trial, that should be electrode zero or one. Trial electrode two or three. Remove the lead and place a new one. So we'll be talking about all of this and hopefully make this very, all of these questions quite simple for you to answer if they aren't already by the end of our course here. We have no mouse. Oh, so the mouses are coming on to allow the cover. Yeah. Okay, well, it's actually more important the second time around, so please, please be thinking about all of this. Oh, there you are. Maybe it's you guys have to do it. Okay. All right, that's interesting. Okay, that's, you know, so kind of almost everything has been picked. So that's good. So we'll discuss all of these things as we go through our little talk here. As you know, the AUA and SUFU got together and made OEB guidelines that have been um, updated a couple times. Dr. Vasavado and I, Dr. Vasavado was on that, uh, on that panel. As you know, first-line therapies include behavioral modification, dietary modification, and physical therapy. I think sometimes the residents don't realize that physical therapy is actually on there and it's considered first-line therapy. So it's important for anybody who might be taking an exam someday to know that for the guidelines. Second-line therapies are antimuscarinics and as of the last iteration, beta-3 agonists were added because right after the uh, guidelines were written, beta-3 agonists came on the market here in the United States. So they, they quickly made an update there. Um, Third-line therapies, of course, is what we're gonna be focusing on today and it includes neuromodulation, basically either chemical chemo, chemo neuromodulation or electrical chemo, uh, excuse me, electrical neuromodulation and we'll be talking about that in very much a case based fashion. So what we want to do is uh, use cases to actually illustrate some of these things to make it a little bit more practical and more interesting rather than just giving you a bunch of slides with bullets on it. And we really want you to be kind of be thinking about what you would do in certain scenarios. We also, especially since it's a small in-person group, we really, really want to encourage interaction. So if you have any questions,
questions, you could just raise your hand and hop up and ask us a question. Um, we can make it a bit of a discussion and throw the ball back and forth if you'd like. We want to look a little bit toward the future, and I'll ask Dr. Vasavada to tell you about what's on the docket these days. And so, you know, you can see what's coming down the pike. Um, as you've seen, we're trying to do audience response. It, we're, I'm just not a technical person, so we'll hopefully work that out by the time we get to the post-test. And then really, again, open discussion. So. Um, so the cases that we're going to be using to illustrate some of these um, techniques are a female patient with refractory OAB, a male patient with refractory OAB, because there might be some different considerations in a male, patients with dual incontinence, which is very common, and that's actually male uh, people who have both um, bladder incontinence and bowel incontinence. Uh, and neurogenic bladder. So we're going to use those as a framework to discuss these things. And the take-homes we really want to give you are going to be, you know, when do you introduce a third-line therapy in your algorithm? In other words, not just when you use it in your treatment, but when do you start telling the patient about it? Because I think that really is part of the sort of art of medicine in the, in the sense of, in the case of uh, overactive bladder. Some counseling tips, you know, what language to use, you know, is one third line therapy better than another? Is it better, you know, in certain cases? Um, optimizing your clinic flow. I mean, that's an, another thing because, you know, some things are more practical in the OR just because it ruins your clinic flow. But really, if you could do it smoothly in the clinic, it might be, you know, a better decision to do it in the clinic. It really does engage and empower your staff to be a part of this, and I think that really excites them, and they get really involved, and, and it, you know, makes them, you know, more involved. Um, minimizing the hassle factor, again, that's part of that clinic flow. Optimizing lead placement, which we'll talk about briefly, and some troubleshooting. So case number one is a 54-year-old healthy woman with overactive bladder. She fails conservative measures, so that's the state, you know, the, um, uh, first line therapies, and she's not really enthusiastic about medications, which is second line therapies, right? Do you um, have to do medications, Dr. Vasavada? Do you think people all have to have medications? And if so, how, how many and what are the limitations? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at the patient, ask them what their kind of preference is. We tried to use these shared decision making tools that we've uh, talked about over the last several years, and this is certainly one area that I think you can incorporate that in. If the patient is not interested in the medication, you certainly can't force them to do it. Um, I think the use of physical therapy or pelvic floor exercises and obviously looking at any other behavioral modifications it can make can really make a big difference. So we'll usually push that as much as we can uh, up front. How many medications do you try? I mean, let's say you give them, on, and, what, and what medication are you starting with these days? Yeah, I think nowadays, you know, so much is predicated on insurance coverage, right? Uh, so, so that's been probably the biggest factor is which one is covered best by their insurance company. Um, I think when we looked at the OEB guidelines originally and, and they plotted out all the efficacy data with all the drugs, they basically all shook out to be the same. So there's really not a whole lot of a conclusion that like, oh, this one's much better. So that said, you know, insurance coverage makes a lot of a difference. We do try to preferentially do a beta-3, I think, as we'll talk about some potential cognitive issues that can occur with some of the anticholinergics does tend to be a factor. Now, in a 54-year-old, uh, you know, we may not really bring that up to the forefront. So, you know, and, and if not, um, you know, we may use like a trospium as a, as a uh, uh, you know, quaternary amine that's less likely to cross in the blood-brain barrier and still falls as a generic. Are you um, in L.A. there, Dave? Are you seeing, you know, patients who come in and the insurance company says, no, they have to try two or three meds before we'll approve a third-line therapy? Right. I think that's a big challenge in that you'll give someone whatever medication it may be, um, whether it's giving them one anticholinergic and you want to go to a beta-3 or even trying an anticholinergic and a beta-3 and you want to go to a third-line and just like we've been overwhelmed the past year with insurance companies telling us you need to fail X number of med oral medications before you can do something that they perceive as being more expensive. Well, it is more expensive, but probably more efficacious. So, you know, I think th the frustrations for me, I, I'm a big believer in our guidelines. And, and they're, they're guidelines. They're not set in stone for every, every patient is unique. But, you know, I think... I'm, I'm frustrated when payers use our guidelines to their benefit and then don't use our guidelines when they think it is not to their benefit, which is an example with this, because there's nothing in our guidelines that would say, you need to fail X number of medications before you consider moving on to a beta-3 or tibial nerve stimulation or botulinum toxin. Usually when you do 
a peer to peer and you talk to someone, you can get something approved unless it's set in stone with that, that insurance company. But again, we don't want to be talking doing peer to peers. It's not part of, it's just not good use of our time. So it's just a frustration that I think I'm sure we are all here having. You know, as a matter of fact, the guidelines, one of the things that I really liked about your update in the guidelines was that it specifically states that this is not an algorithm. Like, so, you know, if you really read the guidelines, you don't have to do a medication before you go to third line therapies. Right. You know, some patients, especially before I moved to Houston, when I was in Seattle, I mean, a lot of people want to go own natural and they don't want meds at all, like this gal here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, so at least per the guidelines, you don't have to do a medication, but, you know, the insurance companies sort of dictate things artificially for us. But, all right, so any other information you would need? And, like, when do you introduce third line therapies? I think that's a, a question that I'd like to ask either one of you. Like at what point in your treatment of a patient, and then what kind of scripting and things? So let's let's talk about when you introduce the third line therapies. Well, I, I would say, I think an important point whenever I start anyone on any medication is I always tell them, if this doesn't work, we're going to have other options. So they understand that if the pelvic floor therapy doesn't work or their oral medication doesn't work, the other option may be. And I'll tell them, we have other oral medications, we have other options like tibial nerve stimulation, or I say neuromodulation and botulinum toxin. Depending upon where I think that patient's going, and I think this is really going to be a tough overactive bladder patient in terms of their degree of symptoms, I may discuss in a little more detail what those third-tier options are. If I think it's someone who is very likely to do well, then I'm, I'm not going to spend as much time and just let him or her know that there are options that are out there. Um, but I think it's important because... We know a lot of therapies that we start off with are don't get the patients to where they want to get to, which is another part of the important part of the conversation is I always tell patients, my goal is not necessarily to make you perfect, but get appropriate expectations that I think we can make you better and hopefully we can make you a lot better and have them understand that so they don't come back and say, gosh, I was getting up four times a night and I still get up twice a night. This is terrible. We'll go to four to two with medication is actually pretty good getting up at night. Right. Yeah. How about you, stand up? Do you yeah, no, I, I would script exactly the same way. I think the only other thing to add is, you know, as we talk about the behavioral modifications that oftentimes are necessary with their patients, that just because we moved them onto a medication doesn't obviate the need to perhaps, you know, restrict caffeine intake, especially if they took a fair amount. And, and, and as we kind of looked at the, what, the third update to the guidelines, we just tried to really make sure that no matter what you do, especially as you get into in the third line therapies even, that you still consider the behavioral modifications and other pieces. So just because you got you know, a neuromodulation device or onovaginal toxin injection does not mean that, you know, you need to drink a pot of coffee and, and, so and work. Right. So, like, th the whole idea of di dietary and, 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 and what you take in is so important that it, and, and it can be, you know, maybe a medical student did that initial H&P and they didn't cover that point as closely, and then I've seen the patient multiple times back, and then we go back and talk about it more, and, oh, yeah, I have four Dr. Peppers and three Cokes a day and, and coffee, and you're like, oh, th this, this might be playing a role. Right. So definitely is important. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so I do the same. I, um, I actually introduce it to them when they come in to see me the first time because if you just give them a prescription and you say, call me if it doesn't work, you're never going to see them again, right? So I say, come back in four to six weeks, um, and if the medications don't work, we're going to talk in more detail about these things. And I tell them that day, you know, so that, and I give them a little thing that, a little sheet that has everything listed on there so that they know we're doing this together. This is a little bit of a journey. It is a little bit of an algorithm to some degree, but, you know, that way they know that there's a reason to come back. Do, do you see them back in the office, or are these patients you do telemed now? Yeah, nowadays telemedicine has really become a bigger part of things, so for the follow-up where I don't actually physically need them there, I do offer that. Some patients prefer to come in, but most really jump at the chance to not pay for parking and fight traffic and, you know. I mean, OAB is a really good telemedicine Perfect. option until yep. we have to do something different. Yep. No, absolutely. I 100% agree. I think a lot of times we'll even use our, our allied health professionals with us, right? I mean, my PA can do those medication follow-ups and and just the same discuss, you know, third-line therapies will maybe in, in as much in depth. Right. Uh, okay. We've kind of beat that up. I want to get to the third-line things, but the bottom line is I think it's important to really introduce it early, and it's important to use friendly language, which we'll talk about. We'll, we'll kind of tell you the things that we say to our patients so that things aren't, so it's not intimidating to them, right? So when we get to the, you know, um, interstem, we're not saying we're going to put a little computer in your 
back, whatever we say, we're gonna put an Oreo-sized cookie battery back there under colonoscopy kind of sedation, you know. So there's things that we that we will use that are a little bit more friendly and less intimidating to the patients, but really establishing, you know, realistic goals. So uh, this is a 62-year-old male with OAB symptoms. He's got urgency with occasional close calls. So he's not really having urgency incontinence, but he's having close calls. He, fre he f uh, voids every one and a half hours and then gets up three times at night. He's got very mild obstructive symptoms. It's really more OAB symptoms, PVR 20 cc's. He's failed medications and he doesn't want an antimuscarinic. So caveats for a male. Do you think there's, it's different for a male? Do you think about other things, um, Dr. Ginsburg? I mean, I, I, to me, male LUTs is one of the more fun things that we take care of because it's a bit of a, can be a challenge. Um, every male with OAB symptoms doesn't necessarily have just OAB and can have some degree of bladder outlet obstruction. And every male with more obstructive LUTs and a low PVR, again, doesn't mean that they don't have bladder outlet obstruction. So it's one of those things where, yeah, it's, it, it can be different. There definitely can be different. You know, the prostate plays a role and, and, and it's kind of the chicken or the egg. You know, do you have, I always tell guys, this could just be primary overactive bladder that we all can likely to get as we get older. This could be symptoms primarily related to just bladder outlet obstruction. And this could be secondary overactive bladder from your bladder misbehaving because it's bothered because you're blocked, you have bladder outlet obstruction. And, and, and it could be all three. <laughs> so it's, it's sometimes uh, a nice challenge trying to figure it out um, if our initial started oral medications doesn't actually work. So Dr. Vasavada, what, what's the minimum, minimum workup that you do? Do you do your dynamics on all men that come in with OAB or do you start empirically with something? Yeah, okay, I think that's a great question. I, I, I do suspect the majority, if not all of the men that I would see, we would do your dynamics on, to the points that David raised. I mean, there's so much overlap with benign prostatic obstruction, and, and but, as you but recall. Are you doing it initially, or after they fail medication? Oh, no, yes. after they fail medication. No, okay. I'm glad you brought that okay. up. Yeah, absolutely. So, so if they've you, tried medications, hasn't worked successfully, right. before we get on to perhaps refractory therapies. I mean, think about it. You know, before, as we'll talk about these, there's a chronicity and, and continuation of therapies that's required. You know, botulinum toxin has to be repeat injected about every six months. Tibial nerve stimulation, we'll talk about every week. And then neuromodulation, you know, with an implant. And you have to ask yourself, could you potentially remedy their overactive bladder with a, you know, in and out procedure that they can do for the prostate if they're really truly obstructed and that's the cause, so. So I think Dr. Ginsburg is gonna talk about on a botulinum toxin and the technique. So what about PTNS? Um, we just talked about this. A few words about PTNS, you know, I wanna ask you what it is. I'm gonna pass the baton on to you because I think you've got some, some talk about PTNS specifically. You know, what is it? How do you do it? What are the pros and cons and where would this fit? Right, so with posterior tibial nerve stimulation, you know, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, where, where, what kind of a role is it gonna have in your practice? Many of you are already doing that. How many of you routinely do PTNS in your practices? So probably about half, okay. Maybe the other half is going to be interested in doing it soon. Um, so it's really a peripheral neuromodulation technique, and I think you have to look at the peripheral nervous system a little bit differently <coughs> than the central nervous system. That said, um, the peripheral nervous system relies oftentimes on a carryover phenomena. So carryover basically means today is what, Saturday. If I had a therapy done, I want my bladder behaving on Thursday when I'm out with friends. So even though I'm not getting active or continuous therapy, the carryover effect, despite not having continuous stimulation, is still working. And that's something that's a little bit more of a unique property, although some will debate that. It's a little bit more of a unique property in the peripheral nervous system. This is equivalent to the old sto stolar uh, affiant nerve system. So for those of you who, who perhaps followed some of this historically, and, and you think about it, and, and the terminology I'll use with the patient, think of it much more like acupuncture. And, and that's really where oftentimes it, it had its roots uh, many, many years ago. And so what we do for the posterior tibial nerve stimulation, typically uh, they come to the office, we use a very small 34 gauge needle that goes right above the medial malleolus and um, the, the nurses or, or allied health professionals typically place that in, place that needle in, we do a 30 minute session and then they take the needle out and they come back a week later, 30 minutes of stim, come back a week later, et cetera, for 12 weeks and then once a month after that. 
And overall, you know, and again, we won't get into huge amounts of uh, you know, data, but the data has been pretty good. That said, it sits currently as a third line therapy for overactive bladder. But patients need to understand and be willing to make frequent visits and comply because this therapy will wear out its benefit as you go on further on with time. So again, this is just a picture showing the tibial nerve stimulation technique. Very simple, they come into the office, kick their kind of ankle up and do. There's minimal of any kind of contraindications. The one contraindication to what we do typically talk about is cardiac pacemaker, so they should not have a concomitant uh, functioning cardiac pacemaker. Um, you know, typically, it hasn't been tested in patients who are pregnant, so those warnings are there. And then s people with probably significant nerve damage, we don't want to make anything worse. The big question comes up with a lot of patients who have neuropathies for a variety of reasons, be it diabetes or other uh, central issues that cause a peripheral neuropathy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a problem, but may not be as a, a effective in someone who, who has an intact, uh, otherwise good uh, functioning uh, neurological system. So, you know, you know, when patients do it, do they tolerate it well? I mean, I think the answer is absolutely. I mean, the morbidity of this therapy is almost none. In fact, a lot of times when we had the representatives from the companies uh, introducing it to one of our offices, they will show the therapy on their own ankles. They just basically take their sock off, kick their ankle up, and then they'll do it to themselves. So that 34 gauge needle really causes minimal, if any, pain. Furthermore, that lower part of the leg is very minimally sensate, so patients themselves don't feel it. So they're not going to, you know, not do it based on, you know, pain or, or the, the uh, issues with that. Perhaps just the repetitive nature of having to come back weekly, that's a different story. Um, the overall success rates, you know, we'll still quote 50 to 60 percent. Now, you can qualify that by that 50 to 60 percent success rate in someone who, you know, how refractory are they? And, and that's the big challenge here because most of the data would really show it's about the same, maybe a slight notch better than medication. And so if you, you had someone who's very refractory, you tried them on a medication, absolutely didn't work. How much improvement did it give you, Mrs. Smith? Zero. Okay, maybe I'll give you 10%. If the answer is something that low, the likelihood of us getting a, a home run by doing tibial nerve stim stimulation, in my experience, has been, been pretty low. Uh, durability, you know, you got to do that therapy for the 12 week sort of induction course and then once a month after that. And those patients, if they do still continue to come back, they do tend to do pretty well. And so they do have to keep doing it. And, you know, I think, you know, we, we have this question of why don't we do more of it? And I think, again, the big limitation is just the actual frequency in the visits, having to travel in and out of the office, and, and perhaps even the effectiveness not being quite as high as we see with with other therapies. So, so Santa, yep. do, do you see yourself doing more of this with implantable stimulators? What do you think? You know, the question, David, comes up. So there's, we'll, we'll talk in a little bit about implantable tibial nerve stimulators. Why? Because, as I said, the challenge being on a multiple frequent visit basis, it's, it's hard for patients to come in. So could you obviate that whole problem by saying, I'm going to put this little implant in that area? What I guess we don't know is, tibial nerve stimulation on a trial basis, in other words, in the office, and if it works, does that mean or pretend that they're going to get a success with their implantable tibial nerve? I don't think we have data on that. Um, or is this going to still be analogous to it? Because as I said, I'm not as enthusiastic about it as a refractory option, but if you look at any of the early implantable tibial nerve data, it's actually much better. Than medication, and so you wonder: Is it because it's not being delivered as frequently? All right, it is being delivered. I should say more frequently because an implantable device, you know, we can do it and set it to every day, every other day. Some of the protocols read for, you know, several minutes a day, if not every couple of days. Um, so that frequency of stimulation in that tibial nerve area might be perhaps the solution that we're not seeing uh, with the infrequent nature of the percutaneous or sort of acupuncture-based approach. And, and, you know, again, that's the big rub here is that can we get something where there's more compliance and, and better results when you give more of it or more time? And, and if we can, then, you know, I think this is certainly has a chance of improving the overall effectiveness and success with, again, the good, good goal of getting minimal, minimal morbidity, which is a, a, a really nice thing about that therapeutic approach. So the pros and cons, hopefully you've appreciated, you've got to make those frequent visits. If the patient's not willing to, maybe it's cost prohibitive to make, you know, you pay to park and, and just the hassle and 
with gas prices at whatever they are nowadays. I mean, all those factors do start to come into play, so you have to think about that. But there's no question as far as refractory options that we have here, and some people would even argue compared to medications that this is really the least invasive or most minimally invasive option. So I, I really can't you know, argue that. I've never had a patient stop because of pain or other issues because of it. Um, the practicality is the, the real challenge. Uh, we do have mostly data that says you have to complete the 12 week course. So trying to shortchange that and say, well, I'm just gonna do six weeks and see how you do. We don't tend to see that effectiveness. So we would typically say if someone's gotten benefits, they typically won't get it till about six weeks and then you have to keep them going. What's very difficult for us is in someone who says at week six, like, yeah, it's helping a little bit, but not that much. And you're, you're just kind of becoming a cheerleader, like, okay, I'm, stick with it, it'll work, it'll work, hopefully next week. And then they come in a week or two later, like, I don't know, it hasn't started working yet. And it, that, that part can be a little bit frustrating, um, but you know, that's what my office staff handles. And then the uh, monthly maintenance is certainly gonna be part of it to continue and maintain the benefits. So there's nothing that's gonna show that you do it at 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks, and then you're done. No, they're gonna need to have continued maintenance of that therapy. All right, we're gonna go on to case three. Okay, so this is a 46-year-old female with uh, dual incontinence. And I think this is one of those cases where as soon as you start to see dual incontinence, you're not gonna do on a botulinum toxin, right? Because that's only gonna help the bladder. So the nice thing about doing either PTNS or sacral neuromodulation is that you can actually get, you know, get a little bonus here. And so patients can be very happy. We much more routinely ask about bowel incontinence now than we ever did before. Um, and that can really make a difference in your, in your treatment options and how you counsel your patients. So she's failed first and second line therapies, and then she has um, accidental bowel leakage is the, is the terminology that we use now. Although I talked to one of my gastroenterologists who said, we don't use that, we use fecal incontinence. So, you know, but the, it's the same thing, and it's a terrible problem for patients. And if you don't ask them, they'll, they won't fess up on that, and yet you can could, you could make such a tremendous uh, difference in their quality of life, as you can imagine. So the best option is sacral neuromodulation. I can argue that in any case. Also, what's happened, used to happen was like it, you feel so bad you did all this work and you make someone completely dry or much better for their urinary incontinence and they're still wearing diapers. Like, well, why are you still wearing diapers? I have fecal incontinence that we never talked about or addressed. So, you know, we're not doing them any favors putting them through all these hoops for their urine if they're having bowel incontinence as well. How many yeah. people routinely ask about bowel problems in their office? Good. That's fantastic. That's great. That's great. Fantastic. And, and that's one of those things I say to my patients, again, uh, just <coughs> sharing the language that I use with my patients because they kind of understand it. I say, you know, command central for the bowel and the bladder are the same place. So if we can affect it, you know, it can, it can help both things. And, you know, they kind of, if you give them, especially with telemedicine these days, I've learned how to, like, try to give them these analogies that, that they can, you know, that makes it easier for them to understand. Um, <coughs> okay, so P and E are staged. So for those of you who do sacral neuromodulation, how many do P and E's? Okay, and how many do staged? And how many do both? Both, okay. Yeah, I think a, a lot of that is a reflection of what the flow is in your clinic, I think. You know, so I, I used to be kind of not not a real big fan of P&E because always they said, okay, well, if P&E fails, then what do you do? You do staged. And I felt like that was a little shaky. But at the end of the day, we actually do P&Es now where I've moved to, and, it, and the flow is great, the clinic is great, and they do surprisingly well with the P&E. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then you can go to the OR, and from a cost savings, if you can take them to the OR just once, anesthesia, rental of the OR, all that stuff, it probably is a cost savings, actually. Did you have a comment, one of you? Did you, you I was that? just gonna add to that, you know, I think that I've seen the same exact difference and I think the difference for us has been that the new p e leads are much more durable once you place it, they're not gonna move like some of the older generation leads. So that makes a big difference for us yeah. and I agree that the tolerability has been good. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Been it's remarkable. Different. So you put a lead in on each side for PNE. Uh, you use pretty much the same technique you would use in the OR. It seems to me you don't have to be quite as precise because it's just temporary. Um, but it, it's been surprisingly successful, you know. So I think it's something to reconsider now that the, the technology has improved. <coughs> the other thing I mentioned earlier is staff engagement. So when your nurse, you know, or your or your allied health professionals, your team, your medical assistant can really be involved and engaged, they really 
they have fun with it. You know, they feel like they're empowered to be a part of the patient's success and treatment. And I think that makes them feel, you know, a, an important part of the team, which they are. But uh, they, and they can also help with programming and educating and all of that. And I think uh, that that really kind of ties the team together. I found that that's been a, a nice factor. And then lean on your reps. So they, whichever company's device you use, I mean, you shouldn't, it, you know, it shouldn't be a time sink for you or your staff. I mean, what I used to do if I needed people to be, you know, interrogated, interrogation, my nurses can do, but reprogramming and going through things, um, we will stack them in our clinic and ask the representative from the company to come in and help us do them. And so it doesn't take up your staff time. Right, so, and they're very willing to do that because it's, you know, shared success and we, you know, it's beneficial for everybody if the patients do well. Okay, so, I, so I have a question for you yeah. about this because I've come to, so now with the, you know, we used to talk a lot about reprogramming, but now with our new batteries, we essentially have mm -hmm. a lot of programs on the battery. Right. So I've kind of come to the conclusion if you know, I mean, sometimes patients don't know how to even just scroll through the programs that are on their battery and we have to come in just to do that. But if they truly are giving themselves an adequate trial on each program that's already pre-programmed, mm -hmm. do you think that we do much by doing other funky programs, usually if there's not a problem with the lead and they're getting appropriate stimulation and it feels okay, right? are we doing much with more? Because I feel less and less at like, Putting them, getting through the hoops, and you know, my PA is a very good programmer, but now we got to do really PhD level programming, and I'm <laughs> going to bring in the rep, and we're going to do all this funky programming. That to me very rarely changes it. I do, I do agree with you in the sense that for those of you who are doing a lot of sacral neuromodulation, you may be aware of this, but the new device now, first of all, you can check from home. So there's a lot of improvements in the device and the communication that we can have with our patients. So if you don't know about this, please ask your reps to, to update you on the newest stuff, the X. Um, but yes, you can put multiple programs in all at the same time, and you can help manipulate um, manipulate it even from afar. Um, and, you know, as far as the reprogramming, I don't think that's going to be quite as, um, we don't have to be quite as meticulous about it, to your point, because now we've got, and we're going to talk about optimal lead placement. If you can get optimal lead placement such that you definitely are coming out of the OR with, with stimulation in all four electrodes under two, under two, then you're not going to, I mean, you're going to be pretty highly successful, I think. And so we're not going to have to go through all this amplitude, change pulse width changes, and all the things that we used to do when we were not as close to the nerve. We weren't sort of surfing the nerve like we can now. So let's talk about that. Again, we're, we can achieve this. At first, when somebody, when they first told me this, okay, you can get all four under two consistently, I'm like, no way. Because <laughs> when I started this, we were still doing cut downs, and we would be satisfied if we came out of the OR with like two electrodes at seven. You know, I mean, we were just trying to do the best we can. Now we've got landmarks that are reproducible and predictable and, you know, that can really help you. And again, it's practice though, so don't get frustrated. But I mean, it, you can do it and pretty consistently you can do it. Okay, you're trying to you're trying to get the superior medial aspect of the foramen because that's where the nerve comes out. Okay, and you can predictably and reliably get there. So let's just talk again case-based. There's a 40-year-old female with OAB. She's had an initial good response with um, sacral nerve stimulation, and she's got declining response. So some of these people who have initial really good results, and then they start to not do so well. You see those patients. I think you know what you want to do is you want to first interrogate, make sure that the impedances are not you know, that they don't have impedances to the circuit. I mean, the circuit is broken on that particular electrode or that circuit and the electrodes are not, electrons are not flowing through. So you can try another electrode or another, another program. Um, you also want to just, uh, you know, make sure you bring them in for that and make sure that they're feeling it in the right place, right? I mean, if they're feeling it in the buttock or the hip, that's just not the right place, right? So you want to, and sometimes you can just change the electrode and they, and they do fine. You, you know, you don't have to change the whole lead, right? Or, or depending upon the patient, it's the easiest fix, and it just got, they turned it off. Okay, and you got to true. turn it on, and that yeah. is amazing how often that happens. That's true. And I think it's important to ask, somehow this, the reformatting came out with this like teeny tiny font, but, you know, asking their symptoms, making sure that, that you know, especially if you didn't do the initial nerve stimulator, 
you know, if they come from outside, you want to make sure that the diagnosis was the right diagnosis before they put the thing in in the first place. Um, check on the battery life. You, you know, nowadays, that, that this has been around, this technology has been around for long enough that we're seeing patients who come in and their battery is dead, right? And, of course, if you put it in 10 years ago, we, we weren't as good about putting it at such a precise place. So we had to turn the battery, you know, we had to drain the battery, turn the device up higher to get the proper stimulation. So we were burning the batteries out a lot sooner. You know, I think you're, you're, they're their best enemy, so, right? Their biggest enemy themselves is because they've made it so good and we're so good at, you know, getting so, the things so, so close. So if you had someone come in ready for a new battery mm -hmm. and part of the problem was they had to have, to have it on like four or five volts to get it to work, yep. would you put a new electrode in or just go with the new battery with the present electrode because, you know, it worked. You just had to I think that's a great question. So what you can do yeah, is actually I don't know stimulate. the answer. There's no answer to that question. I think you can stimulate in the OR, right? You, you open it up and you just stimulate. And once you open it up, you take the, the lead out, and then you can stimulate 0, 1, 2, 3, and see if you get good response, I would leave it. But if you, you know, we're, so, we're just better at it now. So I would definitely do the best I can for them. Because, you know, if you're at 4 or 5, you're probably not in an optimal place. And I think the other thing that comes up nowadays with the newer MRI-compatible leads... Remember, the generator's always been MRI compatible, but the leads are new on both systems, uh, both companies' systems. Then, you know, you're almost obligated to have to change the lead should you want to have a completely MRI compatible uh, system. Yep. This is the old programmer. It's just kind of funny. I put it there because this, this is one picture I could find with um, elevated impedances, if that's the right word, impedances, greater than 4,000 ohms. So that means that the circuit is broken somewhere and the electrons are not flowing through the circuit. And if it's in all your electrodes, then you've got to change the lead because something's fractured. The lead's fractured or the lead's migrated or the connection isn't very good to the battery or something, but it's not the electrons are not flowing through the circuit. It's broken somewhere. Okay, okay. Hey, not to interrupt, there's a question that's through okay. the audience uh, uh, that's not here. Um, and it's a good question. How, how do you counsel patients that get the aha moment with the PNE but don't quite get the same response when you implant the full device? Ah, that's a good question. I actually have that. I was looking for it. I thought it was the next slide. But, yeah, no, that we, we do see that a lot. People are like... You know, they do great with the PE, and then you go to the OR and you put the lead in, and they're just not doing quite as well. And the question really is I mean, I think one thing I always think about is that that, that first result is such a dramatic difference for them. I mean, so, so I think that's why it's very important on the front end when you talk to them to try to quantify the amount of leakage and the degree of bother that it's causing them in the first place. I mean, we see that a lot, right, with somebody yeah. who comes in and says, I'm wearing six pads a day, and then they come in like, you know, six months later, and they say, I'm wearing two pads a day, this isn't working anymore, and you and you say, well, well you started with six, right? I mean, so not that you're, you're not supporting their, their thinking, but just to remind them that this is what we started with. You have some degree of measure of the baseline. Um, but with that, you know, I think it's, it's really, again, worth going through all the programs. And if you really, there's always a possibility that the, the lead migrated a little bit in the immediate post-op period or that we could get and find a more optimal program etc. Um, and, and we do see that happen sometimes. I don't know if it's just because the baseline to the PNE is such a big difference and then, right, it, because it's, it's, you know, they, they feel that treatment so dramatically and then when we repeat it, we, it's not as dramatic a difference. And sometimes it's expectations and, and, you know, there's probably an unwritten placebo phenomenon, right? I mean, these are patients who've got refractory therapies and like what KK said, you know, someone who's six pads a day and they may be down to two, but, you know, boy, like what they've been living with this and their expectations are high. So, you know, we have to manage that. And this is where some of the, some of the subtleties are about what we all do for a living and, you know, quite routinely uh, about having to appropriately manage expectations. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, so patients are... Question? Oh, question. Okay. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, would you mind just please. going to the microphone please, so yeah. the people who are remote can hear? that you moved your PE uh, to your clinic when possible. Do you have fluoroscopy in your clinic or are you placing this by landmarks? Um, we do have fluoroscopy, but you can do it by landmarks also. You know, I mean, I, you don't have to be quite as precise with the PE I I've found. Um, but do, do you have fluoroscopy in your office? Me, no. Yeah, no. Um, so, so, th so we can talk about Unless you work for a big organization, you won't. That, okay, that right, can be true. Right. Do you guys use fluoro for your pe yeah, I also have the luxury of having fluoro in, in my office, so yeah, I can do it. 
So, the, you know, the, the landmarks are the ones that we used to use before we even realized that fluoro could help us, right? So if you feel the sciatic notch, you know, the, and, and you're approximately nine centimeters up from the, the tip of the coccyx, right, is where the foramen's gonna be, about a centimeter on either side of midline. And so your needle, depending on how, how, how large the patient is, the really, if they're really slender, you're probably going to be pretty close to that. Your needle entry is going to be maybe just slightly above that point. If they've got more skin to target, you know, distance, you're going to put your needle up a little bit higher, right? But you'll be able to feel it. I mean, those, those landmarks are still pretty dependable. So I don't think it would preclude you from doing it in the office. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious. So those of you that do P&Es in your office, in your office, raise your hands. And keep your hands up if you do it without fluoro. There's a lot of folks that are doing it without fluoro in the yeah. office. And it, yeah, I, that speaks to the fact that you can absolutely do it without fluoro. Yeah. I'd say there's one other way I've done it where they've had um, in, in our hospital, one of them adjacent, where they have plain film. They can't get a fluoro machine up into my office. So I've actually put markers where I believe the lead will go and take a picture and then they get that and they bring that picture up and then what we do is we can go, okay, I was way off. And as we've known, there's patients who are just sometimes like, oh my God, I would have got this in a million years because it's so far off. And as we've probably all realized, the butt crease is not always in the midline <laughs> and the sacrum is shaped in so many different ways once you do these. Well, if the patient's cattywampus, which yeah, is a right? word I like to use. <laughs> I mean, if they're kind of, you know, you can you can tilt the table and all that kind of stuff. But that's that's why if you can't get a good response with the PE, we, we can do a staged because then you can get your fluoro in the OR. But right. I mean, right. The majority, the reality mm -hmm. is the majority of patients, you could do a PE with landmarks without an issue. Yep. You're going to get that random patient where it is some funky anatomy and then, yeah, you just always have the option for the permanent lead in the, in the OR with fluoro. Um, yeah. Let's look at a couple of these. Um, so this is what you're aiming for. You want to be as medial as possible. Let me see if I got the other pointer here. Yeah. So you want to be like, so the landmarks we use fluoro-wise, let me get closer to the microphone. You're going to use that medial edge of the, of, and so when you do your AP film, all you're looking for is medial to lateral, right? Oh. So this could be just a little bit Mouse oh, the mouse. I, I don't know if I can. Working on. Oh, I don't know if this mouse actually translates working. to that. It's not okay. To that. No, it doesn't. It's it doesn't. Okay. okay. All right. They're not connected. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, this actually, if she's doing well, great. If she's not, this could actually even be a little bit more medial, you can see. This is, you know, not everybody's x-ray looks this nice, but, you know, so when you do your AP film, your first AP film, all you're mm -hmm. marking is the medial to lateral. Right? You're not trying to mark the, the up and down. You're just doing medial to lateral. Um, on the lateral, it's hard for me to see here, but on the lateral, basically you want to see where the SI joint is. So where this, this arc comes in. And it's going to be the next hillock down, okay, is going to be where your S3 is. And you want to be about a centimeter cephalad to the apex of that hillock, ideally. That's what you're going to want to aim for. And then, in an ideal world, you also get this downward curvature, but it's going to be more, you know, what, what, what trumps everything is how the patient responds, if I can use that word. Maybe that's a bad word these days, but what, what you know, you, it, the, the patient's motor response actually trumps the x-ray. So if you get an x-ray that doesn't look that great, but they've got great motor response, I would take it, you know, and don't go for a perfect picture. But, David, you look like you are going to say something. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, mean I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting to think about how this has evolved in that if you talk to us 10 years ago, we'd say this is a perfect x-ray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think now we know that we want to have the lead a little less, sh more, a little more shallow. Yep. So, um, right. so speaking to that, so there's a couple things. One is this could be a little bit more medial. And two, exactly to Dave's point, this is a little bit deep. Now, I think Dr. Siegel, who is kind of the guru of all this, he actually will go a little bit deeper than most of us. Yeah, I usually go, the deepest I'll go is usually with this, the most, you know, um, superficial aspect of that lead touching the anterior aspect of the sacrum. That's as deep as I'll go. As shallow as I'll go is with electrode two and three straddling the anterior aspect of the sacrum. But, but it's also, I mean, to the point, it's, it's where you put that first lead, right? 
because after you have it and you're testing, then you know you're going in, out, wherever, and you go based on where you're not getting a response and you want to keep it where you're getting a response to optimize it. That's right. That's right. So this is a little deep. It it doesn't have that curvature going down, and it actually could be just a smidgen higher if you wanted to be about a centimeter above the... the, um, the apex of that hillock. That being said, you know, again, if she's got great response, I would just leave it alone. You know, you don't have to revise it because the x-ray is not perfect. But if she's not doing that great, this is something that you could do better, right? So this is a patient who I actually did revise. Do you have a question? So I have a question about responses. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously a lot of people do it under general, right? And they just look for the motor. But if you have them awake and you have the option of having motor and sensory Mm -hmm. or motor or sensory, which do you find is the most sensitive for good leaf placement? Um, I find motor, to be honest motor. with you, but your, to your point, we do it under sedation. So I tell them, you know, it's like colonoscopy sedation, and again, or wisdom teeth sedation, and it's again sort of more friendly to them, you know, language-wise. And that way, if you've got, you know, if you've got someone who you're not getting the motor response as much as you want, you can lighten them up a little bit and ask them if they're feeling it, because in the OR. You, you know, I'm mean, sorry, in the recovery room, they're going to feel it probably at a lower mm-hmm. sensa- a lower um, setting than what you were getting your motor at. It's just for their comfort that I, you but know. It, I it's, it's kind of one of these slippery slopes because if you have the patient lightly enough that you think you can do it, but deep enough that they're not going to be happy, then they don't realize what they're doing and they start moving all around and then they mm-hmm. completely, then they're sideways and your fluoro views are completely now yeah. messed up because they're not flat as they were when you got started. Um, and I've gotten to the point where like we were trying to have them just light enough and then the anesthesiologist was like, you know, doing their drip and it wasn't working. I'm like, you know what, I'm going just with motor and keeping it simple. Yeah. So uh, I, that's, I that's kind of my view is I, I care about the motor and I don't worry about the sensory and it's a rare, rare electrode where we have great motor and the sensory is not great as well. I I agree. I I will say, though, that the only patients that I routinely will request a general anesthetic for is patients who have a pain component because they really, they will wiggle around and all that. And, and, you know, they they have a real pain issue that comes along with this. So, And and um, just remember that if you are doing general uh, to make sure they don't use neuromuscular blockade. That's a good point. Otherwise, you're going to wait for a long time to get your responses. This is the same patient, so you can see I, I did revise her. Some other questions. Oh, more questions. Great. I'm so happy. So if you're going to have to intubate, say, a very large patient, <coughs> obviously they're going to have to have succinylcholine. And even with that, although the anesthesiologist always says it wears off in a minute, mm-hmm. your responses are going to be dulled to a degree, at least in, in my experience with it. No neuromuscular whatsoever is always better, but... On the other hand, if you have that patient that's 250 pounds, it's probably not going to be a good experience with you because of so many people moving around. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you usually do your stage ones or uh, those patients that are in the operating room with fluoro? With, do you, what do you tell the anesthesiologist in those cases? I, I actually haven't ever talked to them about holding the succinylcholine, but, and I haven't had a problem with it. So, but, but you're right. I mean, those patients from a safety standpoint, I mean, the anesthesiologist has to choose whatever it is that they feel is going to be the safest for a patient like that for them to, you know, take care of them for an hour of a case. I haven't, I haven't really run into a problem with that. Have you guys? Well, to your point, the, the patients where we started off with them not intubated and at a certain point we're like, this is dangerous. Maybe they're having some emesis, they can't control things, and we have to now stop, flip, innovate, reflip our patients that are either obese or have baseline pain control issues and the anesthesiologist can't, they can't give enough of that, of the profocol drip to make them comfortable, but not too much where then we stop breathing. So it's just better just to tube them. Those are the two groups of patients where I think I have the most that happens the most, but even that being said, it still doesn't happen very often and we can get away without innovating most of the time. Um, and I think a lot of it's gonna be on your anesthesiologist, right, and their level of comfort to be able to ma- ma- monitor those patients and keep them comfortable. And I'm not sure who has to be more comfortable, the patient or the <laughs> anesthesiologist, when, when doing IV sedation only. Yeah. Questions, come on in. 
So this is for the formal lead placement. For the PNE, do you do anything besides local anesthesia? Not me. I just do local. Great. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I think we've done differently, and, and same, we just use local, straight local, but um, I've found that the addition of bicarbonate has made a difference. Um, it seems to make the lidocaine work better. I'll just say that. And, you know, so we'll do like a eight cc's lidocaine with two cc's bicarb and it seems to work better in those patients. So we've all kind of changed to using that eight. eight you know, it also one. takes away the burn. Yeah, it definitely takes away the burn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is that patient uh, revised. It's a little bit more medial. It's the same level, um, but we got a better curve coming down. So again, I think it's, it's all about each patient and sort of, you know, tailoring it to those patients, right? So this is, that, this is the same picture, I mean, side by side. So you can see this was the original one, and this is a little bit more medial, just slightly. But that makes a difference, right? It, I mean, it really can make a difference. And here's the laterals, which I can't see very well from here. But you can see that the placement is just a little bit better. It's not quite as deep. You know, so I think it's worth it if someone comes in, especially if, we, if, you, if the lead was placed 10 years ago or five years ago before you changed your technique or if they come from outside, it's worth trying to get it a little bit better if they're not getting a perfect clinical response, right? So, you know, did great with it. This is that question that came from the audience outside. Did great with a PE, and not so great with a permanent lead. I mean, do better for them, right? I mean, if you have to revise, sometimes if you, you know, they, you can still have a little bit of lead migration even after a long time, but certainly when you freshly put it in there, that's less so with the tined leads, but that can still happen. Um, case 3C and 3D, these are just to show you, you know, if it, here's a patient who came in and had it placed in 2012. We started this new technique in 2013. Okay, so she had um, never perfect, no sensation, and then you check her IPG and life is zero. So to Dave's question, would I change the lead at the same time? Absolutely, in a patient like this, because we just, we've just gotten better at it over the years, and we didn't start the new technique until 2013. Okay, so I have a question that we've never, I know that your answer is going to be, but, I, but we've never asked this question in this course. I hope I get it right. No, you get it right. <laughs> so your patient comes in after a two-week trial, and she wasn't really perfect with her response. Mm -hmm. She's like, ah, I think I'm better, and, I'm, and I, there's not really much else I'm going to do. I really want to get it put in. I'm sure I'll get better when I put the battery in, and we can do better programming. Yeah, that's the kiss of death. Okay. I mean, they probably aren't going to do better, you know, yeah. so I wouldn't, you know, it's a $15,000 device or whatever it is these days, you know, so do the right thing from a, you know, medical system resources. But it's like some of those challenging scenarios we have in the pre-op area because the patients are desperate <sighs> and they really want to have something placed and you really want to help them. And I would say early on in my career, I was much more likely to think and say, yeah, I think we'll get better programming once we get the IPG and we'll make it better. And I don't know if there was any patient that it became a home run for. And probably those are the most likely patients we ended up taking it out six months later because like, why, why do I have this in? Why yeah. did you put this right. in? And that's very frustrating, those early failures. And you know, sometimes in referral facilities, we'll get someone who's implanted elsewhere and then they come in and they're like, yeah, this thing never worked. And, and that's fingernails on a chalkboard for us. You're like, why did you get the implant? Yeah. Um, I, I will just want to make mention of one thing because it's been happening to us much more frequently is audits by Medicare, and they've been asking for voiding diaries. Oh, Have any of you been asked to provide voiding? And I'm not talking from a few weeks ago's implant. I'm talking from like 2018 and 2019. I think the government's been shaking the money tree, and they're trying to you know get it back from a lot of us. So we've been very, very proactive of making sure our Scanity. voiding diaries are in, scanned in, and, and that we have that. And we, we've almost scared the patients into making sure that they won't show up and they like literally hand it to us quickly. <laughs> like, okay, here it is, don't lose it. Yeah. And we have it scanned in. And yeah, scan it into the record. So this is that case that never worked at an outside facility. I mean, go through all the, you know, x-ray, take a look and see if it looks good radiographically. Interrogate the device and see if they feel it in the proper place. All of that, as if it were one of yours. And you just want to, but you've got to start at the beginning um, to see if it was worth revising. Um, the question is, do you do a staged procedure? Do you do a PE and in a patient like this who says, I got it at an outside facility and it never worked, right? You know, doing a PE and is not unreasonable because, you know, you don't know if it didn't work because it was never going to work for this patient or it didn't work because the technique wasn't optimal. Um, and again, it's an expensive device and it's an expensive journey to the OR. So, you know, starting over is not out of the question. 
Okay, I think we're getting close. Now, uh, I put these slides in because this was from many years ago. These aren't ours. <laughs> but the point is, I always say to the residents and fellows, oh, actually working well but annoying lower extremity sensation. I mean, you want to take a look and see what the placement is, right? So these were patients that we had come to <coughs> us that had, you know, leads that didn't look that bad, but, you know, this one not so good. But again, you can always improve on it. So it's good to, you know, kind of see what you're starting with. But the important message is don't judge placement by what we know now because we're just better at it, right? We're all getting better at it, which is great. You know, just when you think you can't get any better or there's no other information to help guide you, we get something else, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and I'm going to show you one that is my own. <laughs> and I show you this because I always tell the residents and fellows, don't judge, don't judge, because this is, you can tell, actually, if you look at these leads, that these leads are from, you know, 2000, early 2000s when we had a big uh, lead one, I mean, electrode one. So this gal had many, she had several pregnancies, she had several revisions. This we started, she, she got a cut down, you know, and since then she's actually done very well. She was idiopathic retention, so it's not, it's not overactive bladder, but I show this to you because I swallow my pride and show my residents and fellows this, that it was a learning journey, right? And so even these, I mean, this is, if, if somebody did this today, I would <laughs> probably give them a little feedback, but, um, but you know, this is, this is our learning curve. We didn't have landmarks. We didn't know really where is the best place to put her, how to get it there. So, uh, so with that, yeah, this is the lateral. And so obviously these are more, my more um, recent ones. And so, and she's done actually quite well. She was one of those, one of those few who really responded nicely with her retention. Okay, did you make any effort to try to get any of the other leads no, out? You know, you can't because you have to go anterior when they're that deep. Right. You know, so you have to do an anterior approach to get that. So we just left it. But, and thankfully she's not needing NMRIs or anything, but that, that could be an issue because that was a long time ago. So in the interest of time, I just want to, you know, really the take homes for this section is really engage your staff, um, consider batching. And when I say that, I mean like if you've got people who need to have reprogramming, you can bring them in and have the rep come and help you also. And I think that's a good use of your time and staff and the, and, and your help with the, with the company um, representatives who really want this to work as much as we do. Um, PTNS ties up the room, but not the staff. P &E, if P&E ties things up too much in your office, you can do it in the OR, but P&E is reasonable, and much more reasonable than I used to think it was, in all honesty. Um, and I think we all get better with time, so it's worth practicing. And I tell you, it, this is one of the most satisfying things that I do, because patients, when they respond, it like changes their world, right? And you, and you can take credit for that, which is really kind of fun. But, you know, it's something that I don't, nobody really knows exactly how it works. We have some mm -hmm. theories about it, and people much smarter than me could explain it to you, but the fact is, it's it's pretty remarkable how, how much of a difference you can make. Uh, so we're going to go on to neurogenic bladder now. So 46-year-old female with multiple sclerosis and OAB. She's failed first and second line therapies, and she's got detrusive overactivity on your dynamics, which not everybody with urgency does, obviously. I'm going to pass the baton over to Dr. Ginsburg to talk a little bit about uh, onobotulinum toxin. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys a question. So we've always gone into talking about botulinum toxin with this patient with MS. Tell me how your use of sacral neuromodulation has changed with MS patients now that we have MR-compatible devices. Because we know that MS patients can have the true overactivity. You think about what are the, there's four indications for neuromodul sacral neuromodulation, right? urinary urgency frequency, urgency urinary incontinence, so the storage symptoms, non-obstructive urinary retention, we can see that with MS patients, okay. and fecal incontinence. So it really can be an amazing option for the right patient. Has this changed how you've been managing the MS patients? Yes, remember the label has been still for uh, not neurogenic patients. So for neuromodulation. I, I didn't say it was for neurogenic. I okay. just said the we're, symptoms. We're treating the symptoms, so just exactly. But to be clear, you should make sure you're highlighting that, not diagnosis of neurogenic bladder. So I think that would be a very important thing to make mention of. And then to David's point, yeah, I mean, in, in so many respects, it's almost the ideal therapy, right? Because it could help any and all of those issues with which often can affect the MS patients. I think the one thing you have to ask yourself as you're looking to select those patients for neuromodulation is, 
you know, kind of their abilities, uh, physical abilities, are they gonna be able to handle this device? Um, in other words, kind of where on the spectrum in MS they have. We've all seen MS patients who you'd never know they had MS unless you knew their diagnosis in the background. They're very highly functioning, everything's fine. And then we see the other end of the spectrum where they come in on a stretcher and you know, you know, they, they just can't move. So ask yourself where on that spectrum is, and I suspect all of us would agree that you wanna do the patients on the much more milder end of the spectrum to see if you can help them. Right, to, to your point, when I see an MS patient that I think we may be considering neuromodulation, I completely stop using any kind of neurologic diagnostic code and just go with their symptom code, whether it's frequency, urgency, urgent continent. So if blue, whomever wants to go back two or three or four visits back, they're not gonna see any neurogenic codes there. Um, I, I haven't gotten it denied because it was a patient with MS, but you know, if you get a sophisticated person looking at it, they may raise a question. Agreed. Yeah, but, you, but I think it's, sorry. I think it's perfectly fair to say, you know, to, to go based on the symptoms. They, I don't think that they would really be able to, it's not contraindicated in a neurogenic bladder, basically, no. right? So it, it, we're treating the frequency, urgency, and urgency incontinence. And I think as long as you maintain that, and I don't fact, think they would be able to deny it. And in fact, the neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction guidelines, which were introduced at last year's AUA, um, actually speak to um, to that as as certainly an option in the appropriately selected patient with MS. Well, I mean, and if you'd like to hear about the guidelines, come to our instructional course on Monday when everyone's already going to be home when we do it. But we're more than welcome <laughs> to have you. <laughs> yeah, but I was going to say, the reason why it, it's not contraindicated in neurogenic patients, obviously, it was because the lead was an MRI compatible. And so that's the reason. So you don't want to code it, you know, in a way that's going to bring up lights to right. it. But I mean, the fact is, it was really more of a, of, of a safety thing. I mean, you couldn't put a lead in. Um, and then someone who you thought was going to have to have MRIs. So, so the so the answer there is a question here about are urodynamics necessary, and this actually does bleed in a little bit to the neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction guidelines. I don't think we need to do urodynamics on every single neurogenic bladder patient, especially patients if you are voiding volitionally, and you have a low PVR. The recommendation is only to do urodynamics for a neurogenic patient if it's gonna help guide your therapy, if there are issues. Now, if someone's on catheterization or they have incomplete emptying, those patients should have urodynamics. So I'm actually speaking to the neurogenic guidelines um, on that. So are urodynamics necessary? If this patient came in, and I can go back on the slide, you know, she's 46, she has MS, OAB, and you know, as Sandip said, there's a wide variety of of abilities and disabilities with MS. If this woman walks into my office, you don't really see anything obvious as that she having a neurologic deficit leading to MS and her PVR is five cc's and she has typical urgency frequency, urgent continence, I'm probably not doing your dynamics on her. It's not going to change anything. If she comes in and she has sim same symptoms but her PVR is 220, I may do urodynamics, and you're gonna to have to have the discussion if we're gonna do botulinum toxin, are you gonna to be okay doing catheterization? We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, you'd, agree that prob you'd agree that probably in that scenario that the post-void residual helps you maybe the most, right? The I mean, PBR is very, very helpful. I mean, like you said, the MS patients are so interesting. A lot of, I mean, again, you can have a lesion in the brain, you can have a lesion in the cord throughout the entirety of the cord. So it certainly impacts the kind of void and dysfunction you're gonna see. You know, a higher lesion, if it's in the brain, you're gonna have just like, just to choose over activity, no sphincteric dysfunction at all, no, no dysinergia. Just, just behaving like essentially an OAB patient. So they're gonna have a low PVR. David, I'm just gonna repeat a question um, that's coming in from uh, Zoom. Uh, wouldn't you want to evaluate compliance for counseling purposes? So patients with, so it's really important, right? We don't wanna miss someone that has elevated detrusor storage pressures leading to upper tract issues. So again, we're going back to the neurogenic guidelines. These are really important questions. I would say if you want to hear more, please come to the course on, on, on Monday. Um, patients with MS are very unlikely to have poor bladder compliance. That would be very unusual. And especially someone who is voiding volitionally with a low PVR, it would be 
highly unusual they're going to have poor bladder compliance. And in fact, it's so unusual that there is not even a recommendation. You know, there's different levels of uh, risk stratification for a patient that's low, medium, and high. So anyone with neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, whether it's MS, Parkinson's, stroke, um, uh, cerebral palsy, if they're avoiding volitionally and they have a low PVR, there's no surveillance studies needed and there are no urodynamic studies needed. We treat them empirically and then you would do studies like that if things change, bladder symptoms change, recurrent UTIs, whatever it may be. But those are not patients that are likely going to have a loss of compliance, but again, things change. For example, a great example of that is in adults with CP. They intend to have, over time, can have difficulty emptying their bladder, and that changes. So again, it's a change, and now they're gonna have an elevated PVR. But someone who has a low PVR, the likelihood of that patient having loss of compliance is very low. So there's not, are, are you doing, do you feel the need to do your dynamics in those at all or? No, I, I think we both agree that probably in, a, in, in someone who's otherwise emptying their bladder well, I'm, I'm not terribly right. worried. So we kind of talked about some of the issues with who to and not to, or we're gonna go to this a little bit more with botulinum toxin. Um, so, so, so KK, you called me up a little early because you usually ask me these while you're standing here, but I'm going <laughs> to answer the questions because this again speaks to how we use our staff. So, so KK was talking about how we use our office staff for helping us do P&Es or programming our neuromodulation patients or with tibial nerve stimulation. I don't see the patients. Sharon, uh, PA that works with me, she does it all. And like literally, I have a video from my prior PA where it takes 90 seconds for the PA to do the entire process to get it started. Um, Botulinum toxin is the same thing. There is no reason for you to do a, a significant part of what we do with botulinum toxin. So our nurses are catheterizing the patient, putting the local anesthetic in, preparing the Botox in one of my locations, in the other location, it's part of LA County Department of Health Services and I have to mix the botulinum toxin because they're not allowed, whatever it may be. That's, I, I can do that, that's not a problem. But I'm not putting the, so they're putting the catheter, they're putting the catheter, they're putting the local and you know, 10, 15 minutes later, whatever it's gonna be, let me know, put the scope in and do the injection. So the nurses are the ones that are gonna do all that and certainly have your nurses do that so the time you spend doing your botulinum toxin injection is really just the injection time. Because you already talked to the patient prior about what to expect. And what I do is while I'm doing the injection, I'm talking to the patient about the follow-up, what they can expect peri procedure, things to watch out for, and when to call me if there are issues. And really the biggest issue that, we, what, what do you worry about? I tell patients there are three things you worry about botulinum toxin. It doesn't work, you get a urinary tract infection, or you, you're worse. And you're worse because now you're leaving urine behind. Or you're not better because you're leaving urine behind. Any, do you guys do anything different when you're having it done in the office? I know how much, what percent of, who, how, how many of you here do most of your Botulinum toxins in the office? And in the OR or surgery center? Yeah. And I'll do a couple in the OR or surgery center, but patients just can't tolerate it. Um, I do get frustrated with the patients will come in and say, doc, we got to do this in the, in the OR. And I haven't even done it yet. I'm like, just let me try, it's, it works. The majority of patients is fine. So we just have discussion usually in a shared decision-making process with me really pushing that decision. We can do it in the office, but, but not always. Um, so dilution dose template. So a variety of ways that, that this has been done over the course of time. So if you all recall the first that were the first ever urologic paper using botulinum toxin was actually done for injecting the external sphincter protrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Didn't work great. But the first one that really led to bladder injections was at 300 units in a spinal cord injury patient population. And studies have now shown that we probably do, we're doing fine and it's FDA approved for 100 units in the overactive bladder population. And I remember in 200 units for the neurogenic patient population, this is one of these questions I'm always asking my residents. What are the indications? And they'll say, the trues are overactivity. I'm like, for what? And they'll look at me, I'm like, 
So overactive bladder, we have to do a urodynamic study. They're like, uh, no. So what are the indications? It's urgency and continence. It's not a urodynamic indication. Now the neurogenic patient is actually a, neuro, a, a, a neurogenic that triggers overactivity. You had to have triggers overactivity on the urodynamic study. Now that being said, I told you I wasn't going to get a urodynamics on the MS patient because it's not going to change anything. But that those are the indications for those with neurogenic. It's 200 in the overactive bladder patient. It's 100. And now for those of you that are doing your injections, I'm sure you know you're going to dilute it with, with, with saline and you're not going to shake up the vial because there's a, a, a heavy chain and a light chain of the, of the, of the, of the molecule brought together through a disulfide bond and that, that those has to have to be attached because the heavy chain gets it into the nerve ending and the light chain then cleaves the snare protein so the vesicles that attach to that nerve ending and then spill out the acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters in that neuromuscular junction now are blocked for that period of time. So don't shake the vial. Um, we're going to talk about use of a rigid or flexible scope. Um, I don't have a choice in my office because we just have flexible scopes for both men and women. That's all we have in our office. And you all may have both. We'll talk about the pros and cons of each. And needles because there's a whole variety of needles that you can use. So um, I love this video that I have. This is a video on a patient who had Parkinson's and we ended up being late and she didn't get home in time and you could see she was overdue for her meds. So this is not me doing a Botox injection while on a cruise ship in the middle of a hurricane. This is just her shaking because she was really just overdue for her Parkinson meds. Um, but you can see this is me using the flexible scope with the Olympus needle. Um, and I'm usually doing one to two cc's, so five to 10 units depending upon the, the, the dosing. Um, I tend to be someone that doesn't go after the trigone often, but part of it also is because I use a flexible scope and I think flexible scopes are harder to get to the trigone. You can do it. Just some patients it's easy and other patients it can be very challenging to get to the trigone. Um, you can say I like to get like a little bleb there. Like to me, I always say it's a subtle rise. Um, if I get a bleb, I don't care because I don't think it matters. Just got to get it somewhere in the bladder. Um, so if you think about a rigid scope versus a flexible scope, uh, you have Actually, a question, Kate? No, no, I was just going to say, you know, that, that was a beautiful film. I think, I think the point is that if you don't get any rise, I call it a ground swell. I say, you know, you should get a little bit of a ground swell. And if you use a rigid scope and you've got that, that four millimeter mark on there, I put it, I put the thing in, you feel this little pop as it goes through the mucosa and then you back it up a bit. So it's like, Three millimeters, it, you know, it's, a, it's not quite the four millimeter mark. And I pull it back, and you get a, you get this ground swell. You see it kind of coming up like this. If it's too superficial, it looks like a hydrocele. It's too superficial. If you get nothing, you're too deep. So I, I do think, I think. Well, the popping is, you feel the pop, or you, you really feel the pop. But like when I'm doing it with the residents, like they'll pop, and they're like, you can see them like almost putting a little indentation in the bladder. Yeah. And I'm always putting my hand on theirs Pull and pulling the needle back until you don't see that indentation. And to me, that's the sweet yeah. spot where you're But it's the ground swell. So I mean, patients' bladders are gonna have different thicknesses. I mean, I think you, in the first one or two, you're gonna know kind of how well, deep. Well, I, I like the fact that you called it a film and not a video, because it makes me think it's up for Academy Award consideration, <laughs> so. <laughs> David, there's a question uh, yes. coming in. I had a patient who was actively having a detrusor contraction while injecting, <sighs> making it challenging. Any tips there? Oh my gosh. So when you, yeah, that is a great question on a really tough scenario. And, and those patients, no matter, I, you, I try to kind of find that wherever it's gonna be, that volume, and sometimes it's 50 milliliters, it might be 100 milliliters. You often, you get those patients that are just, have such bad DO that you can't get it filled to the volume you want. Um, and then you just gotta go fast before they have another. And like, those are ones where my template is a little bit out the window and the volume might be a little bit out the window. The other place where that happens, is I'm actively injecting someone spinal, with, spinal, with spinal cord injury and they all of a sudden have dysreflexia. And like, I need to get out of there. So the question is, am I just gonna stop now? And I. I've been taking care of spinal cord injury patients since 1997, which makes me sound old, but it also gives me a little, I, I'm a little bit less panicky when they start to tell me they're having headaches and sweats. Um, and and, and, and you, you should be monitoring those patients at all times when you're doing that and getting their blood pressure. But if, if that's bad, like literally, if I'm doing 200 units and I just started and they're already getting dysreflexia, I literally may do four injections total and just 
you know, boom, boom, and just try to space it out, but just get the, get the botulinum toxin in. Um, so I, that's the only hint. I mean, you guys do anything differently? Yeah, 100% exactly yep, that. Same. Yeah, so you can, you can use more per injection more than, than you typically do. And, and, and if you find someone that does really well and they're always having dysreflexia, I mean, even just for your own blood pressure, you may find that that's actually a patient you're gonna do better doing it in the operating room. And, and that will protect, I mean, that's, what's, that's a great treatment for dysreflexia, just giving anesthesia. Um, now we've also, will pre-treat, we can give them alpha blockers, calcium channel blockers, that also can be very helpful, but you know, it's, it's really, I mean, again, I, I'm at a spinal cord injury unit two days a week, we have a lot of dysreflexia, it's really, really unusual where this is a problem. Um, we, it's usually patients do fine with this. Yes. See any value to pre-treating with high doses of ditropan, urabel, something beforehand? Or you know, I've never done that. The pre-treatment I do is usually an alpha blocker or a calcium channel blocker. Um, I don't mean for the spinal cord. I'm sorry. I mean for the regular office patients. Oh, I've never, you, you mean for the, just to stop the spasm? I mean, it's, again, that's really unusual where that happens. So I haven't felt the need to do that. Yeah. Thankfully, that also is unusual. Um, the patients I think are more likely, I, I'm guessing it's probably like the radiation patients are some of the more challenging ones where they just have trouble holding on as much as anything. Yes? So kind of in a similar accord, so spinal cord injury patient, radiation patient, where um, you're going in for neurogenic bladder purposes, planning on doing 200 units, and let's say that their bladder is just very small and contracted. What are you, how are you altering your template or what are you uh, injecting more uh, or less, or are you just? I, I, I may do less locations with more botulinum toxin. Is is sorry if I didn't make that clear. Um, the other one, like the other one that can be a problem to bring up the radiation patients, is you like you do your first injection, and then it starts to bleed. I'm like, oh crap, now I can't see anything. And you know, and it, you really want to see you do some. And I have had one patient where I, I just I couldn't finish it, and uh, okay, we can do it again in the office or go to the OR where a little bit more control. But that's the other one where I've I've had a, a, a rare problem. Yes. Yeah. Any experience with the uh, injection in patients who are kind of a fuzzy diagnosis of interstitial cystitis? You know, they're like borderline cases in the middle where you think it is, where you somebody thinks it is not. Uh, any of those cases? Right. So those are challenging patients, right? Because, you know, some patients will tell you that they have terrible urgency and other people tell you this, this, their urge is painful and like, okay, is it, is it, yeah, I see painful urgency or is it more overactive bladder urgency, right? And you can't figure it out. So, um, that I, I do it. I've done those patients where you're not entirely sure. Um, and I, I've done it in the office without an issue. The biggest challenge, I think, for that patient population is if you want to see an unhappy, painful bladder patient, it's the one that now you put into retention and they have to do IC. So you really got to be careful with that. Now, my recommendation isn't to do less, because I think if we're going to do it, you want to give 100 units, which is a dose that works. But just be very careful that you think that this patient truly has OAB, because you don't want to put them into retention. Any, anything else you guys would add with that? thing is that, you know, I mean, obviously they have frequency and urgency, but those are patients I might consider putting a little bit in the trigone, just because that's... Uh, that's a good point, yeah. And th those are patients, if you're going to do a trigone, it's those that have more sensory problems, where the sensory, the, the, the nerve endings are. Um, absolutely, that's where I would try to go in the trigone. Yes, thank Same you. Same thing yeah. is true for a 45, 48-year-old male who has a lot of chronic prostatitis off and on and urinates every half hour. Uh, well, I'm not sure we're going to help the prostatitis part, but if he has painful bladder, then, then again, same idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, circle neuromodulation is also a consideration for those patients. They do, you know, there's an afferent component to all of these things that we're talking about. And, you know, so I think it really, I mean, we're, I mean, on a botulinum toxin, the way it works, right, is just like, like Dave was saying, it, it, it prevents the fusion of the pre-vesicle, the pre, the, the neurotran what do you call the vesicle with the presynaptic membrane, so it can't release it into the synapse. That can work for any neurotransmitter. So cholinergic, you know, and the uh, cholinergic receptors or the purinergic receptors, where you know we're talking about pain. So you might be able to get some benefit from that. And sacral neuromodulation, I've also seen patients who really respond well with that pain component, which isn't the reason why you're taking them to the OR, but it might be. 
But you still have to so, code it frequency and urgency. So for those of you that are old enough, there was a term that we used to use called sensory urgency, which was that term of you had a lot of urgency and frequency, but whenever you did a urodynamics, there was no detrusor or overactivity. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's, I mean, you know that 50% of patients with urgent incontinence don't have detrusor or overactivity on urodynamics. So, you know, but if you think it's that really that sensory component, you know, in my mind, I, I try to push those patients more to neuromodulation because I think that's a better option for them. Because um, again, I don't want to put them into retention if they're already having sensory issues. So you have the rigid scope. So in my office, I just have a flexible scope. Um, certainly it's easier for men. There's no screaming from the procedure room when you're using a rigid scope. Um, it's more expensive and it's more expensive for a couple different reasons. First of all, the needles are more expensive. You're working with needles in a working channel and, and, that me, and for we have residents, so I'm always like, please don't put the needle through the working channel or <laughs> take it out with the needle exposed. We did that, um, especially for inexperienced flexible cystoscopist, the template is harder to identify. And when I really appreciate that is when we have a switch in March and April where the urology FPRMS fellow goes to gynecology and the gynecology FPRMS fellow comes to urology. And on, on the gyne side, they just use rigid scopes because they don't have men. So then I get the gyne fellows in and this is their first foray really using a flexible scope. They love the challenge. Uh, and it is a challenge for them because they haven't been in a lot of time with this. They have a tougher time spaying on the template with the flex scope. Um, and you need three hands because you got one hand on the scope and one hand with the needle, someone else has to do the injection. I mean, in the worst case scenario is you put the needle in and you do the injection, but that's a pain in the butt. So it's always nice to have one of your assistants there to do that. And, and with the rigid scope, it's easy to do with two hands. Um, so I'm gonna go through these different needles to give you an idea for those of you that you know, don't have a preference or are, are doing this a lot in the office. So by far and away, this is um, my, my favorite needle. Um, as you can see, it has a, a, a sheath and then you can see in the middle scope that the, the, the needle, the middle picture, the needle is pushed through, so the needle is exposed through the sheath. And on the, on the picture on the right, the, uh, the, the needle is in the sheath but not pushed through, so then it's protected when you pass it through. Um, it has the best deflection and it has the sharpest needle. It also is the most expensive needle. So if you're in your own office and you're not gonna have a fluoro machine, you probably don't wanna buy this needle either because it's the most expensive needle. Thankfully, I don't think that USC knows that I have them buying the most expensive <laughs> needle. And please, I hope they're not watching this on live stream and making me use another needle because um, this, is, this is a wonderful needle. Um, the other next one is the Cook needle. Um, this works fine. The thing that's a little bit funky about this is you, it, you have to preload it. So it has a protective sheath so you put the needle in through the working channel before you place it in the patient. Then you have the needle just inside the working channel. Then you take the protective sheath off. So don't take the needle through and then you put the scope in that way. Um, this deflection is pretty good, but I don't think it's good as the Olympus needle. Um, I was gonna ask you before you get too far involved in the actual needles, just more philosophical, because there's a question coming in. What's your take on APPs performing Botox? So um, I, th I, th it, I think it depends on your APP. I mean, we have, we have a lot of providers, APP providers at, at USC, um, and we don't have anyone doing Botox yet, but like, for example, we have APPs doing a prostate biopsies all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we have How APPs that do flexible cystoscopies. So I don't- as well? Uh, not yet, but I don't think, do you guys, you have it? Tried um, unsuccessfully, but uh, there are definitely practices are around doing, the country where there's people who who have their APPs doing. Are you doing Botox? Anyone doing Bo anyone, anyone yeah. having their APPs doing Botox in the office yet? Not yet. I think it's certainly feasible. Yeah, I think you have to. I think the key is you you have to have that APP that is already very comfortable doing cystoscopy. Doing the injection is not hard. It's doing the cystoscopy. So if you have an APP that is a good cystoscopist, then you would have an APP that should be a fine at doing Botox injections. So the only thing is that they bill, I believe, eighty-five percent. So you're they, they may lose money on the technical side. 
you'll, you'll lose a professional size, you'll lose 85. But, but you work at institutions that <laughs> doesn't <laughs> run salaries. <laughs> but if your office has something you have to think about it in private practice, for absolutely for sure. I mean, that's very important. Um, the library needles is, the one cool thing is you can change the, 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 the length of the needle. Um, the one thing that I don't love about it as much is I think it has less deflection when you're working with the flexible scope. <coughs> and last is, is the Williams needle that you work with a rigid scope. It's dirt cheap, I think it's $12 or even less That's than that. It's not very sharp. Um, no, you have to push. And what you have to be careful with is if when you're going in and out, you can get it up to bend at a right angle, right where white and blue meet. And if it does that, you can get a little crack in the tubing and then all your Botox is, is going outside. So that doesn't work very well. <coughs> so this, when I do this, we're doing it in the office. Um, thank you. And I mean, we're doing it in the OR. So I'm there with the resident or the fellow doing it. And I'm just actually, I'm that, I'm, the, I'm actually doing the injections, even though it can be a two person job. And when they're, as they're pulling the needle in, I'm actually pu pulling back on the syringe so the needle doesn't bend. Cause I don't want to get that bend in the needle. Um, they probably are irritated that I'm involved in something as simple as a Botulinum toxin injection, but I just don't want the needle to bend out, bend over. David, so please come cover it now. Oh. Anything specific for how you inject them now in terms of templates? Do you do a, the same thing on everyone? Do you kind of modify it based on patient profile? Yeah. So templates are templates have evolved a lot. So when when we first did the trials to get Botulinum toxin FDA approved, it was. 20 to 30 injections across the template as this illustration shows. And, and then we've, and then I kind of realized, I, do I have to be that many injections? Does it really matter? We're just getting the botulinum toxin in. So I, I've kind of gone now down to 10 injections, one cc at a time. What are you guys doing? That's what I did. Mm -hmm. 10, one, yep. 10 and one. And normally, normally I don't get the trigone. I get trigone. Normally you get trigone? I do trigone. I, and I how many trigone injections will you do? Two. Two. So you're kind of, well, we're going to go to that. We're, I'm going to show you what they're doing in a moment, probably. Um, and there's all sorts of alternate <laughs> paradigms. Um, some folks have advocated even doing just three injection sites. And, and not just because the patient has dysreflexia. Just do three injection sites as, as part of what you're doing. And then obviously you're going to do a much larger volume and a much higher in, in each injection site. Um, a newer a newer concept is eight peritrigonal and two intratrigonal. So this gives you the idea of the alternative template where you're doing that again, two on the trigone, and, and you're doing this with a rigid scope or a flexible scope? Rigid. Rigid. Usually rigid, but I mean, we have flexible also, and I, it is harder because you come in at an angle. Right. So, so there are certain patients where it's hard to do this with a flex scope. Not all, mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, with, a, with a rigid scope, it's not a problem. It's easy. Um, so this was an alternative paradigm that has been proposed with the idea of if you stay more on the trigone, more sensory, less motor, less risk for urinary retention. And this was actually presented at SUFU. I don't think this has been, I looked again, I don't think it's been published yet. <laughs> Have you seen, I, can I looked again, it's just when we're updating the slides. So the thought was the efficacy is comparable to what was seen in the phase three overactive bladder trials, but no one required clean intermittent catheterization. So your risk of retention is much lower. So and the thought is maybe you're looking more at the afferent targets of what's going on with overactive bladder symptoms. Um, what about UTIs? And how do we guard against UTI for patients with botulinum toxin? So when we did these studies to get FDA approval. You know, the people that are sponsoring the studies, Allergan wants to have as few bladder infections as possible. So if you look at the PI, which is the package insert, it goes by how the trials were done. You'd have antibiotics one to three days pre and post, one to three days. So and I, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to give more antibiotics before and after Botox injection than I would for an active UTI. I'm gonna give more antibiotics than I would for putting in a artificial urinary sphincter. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? You don't need all these antibiotics. 
and especially as we got a better understanding of antibiotic stewardship and the importance of not overgiving antibiotics. So I give patients one dose, a quinolone, or maybe I'm moving away from quinolones, but just one dose, I think it's not a problem. Um, I think it's important, remember, you don't want to give an aminoglycoside with botulinum toxin because it, it potentiates aminoglycoside. Um, I do not look to sterilize the urine before a botulinum toxin injection. I don't even look for a urinalysis or a culture because I'm, again, I'm not sterilizing the urine. If someone has active signs of infection, I'm not going to inject them. But I think that's something that we've seen more with, say, the neurogenic patient population where they're doing clean intermittent catheterization and there are some folks that were always, well, I want to get a urine culture beforehand. I want to get them sterile. These guys aren't sterile. You're not going to get them sterile. You're never going to be able to do the botulinum toxin injection. Um, so if you look at what else is in the literature, there's a whole variety of options out there. Um, studies that have shown that the ad there's adverse events are not impacted by the results of the urine dipstick. So we suggest that getting a urine dipstick is not gonna change what you're going to do and really base it on the patient's symptoms and if there's an active infection, probably hold off on doing the injection. People looked at different periods of time for infection and actually there was a suggestion there's actually more risk of a UTI with longer antibiotic use. You know, to my mind, that raises the question, are the patients that are getting more antibiotics those with the current UTIs to begin with? And that's why they're more likely to have more infection. Um, three days of quinolone with single period or single dose septraxone. Well, I'm not doing either. I'm just giving one day of a quinolone, so I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, there's two different, there's several different pieces of the literature that suggests that for patients with mostly sp with spinal cord injury that were having a recurrent UTI, when you treat them with botulinum toxin, their UTI risk goes down. They have less episodes of recurrent UTIs and we're probably just making that bladder a safer bladder, a better bladder, less elevation and el less elevated storage pressures and a bladder more able to fight a normal urinary tract infection. So, you know, Dave, we're actually doing a study right now randomizing patients to getting antibiotics or not getting antibiotics at all because prior to when we were doing on a botulinum toxin A injections from 2002 for 10 years off label, we were all yeah, doing it. Yeah. I never gave antibiotics. And then when it became FDA approved and they said you have to give antibiotic, so I was trying to be compliant with that. Um, you know, so right now so far where we've been where we've enrolled like 80 patients or something and there's no difference. Yeah, I'm not yeah, surprised. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's randomizing. And, and it's These are for thing. OAB patients. OAB, it's not neurogenic, so that, okay. you know, maybe neurogenic patients may be different. Yeah. But I mean, we, I think we all overutilize, you know, so we're trying to prove it so it can, like, help us not not have to give antibiotics when it's not necessary. Yeah, we're not even routinely checking urine dips, and, and David yeah. mentioned it, but just to reiterate, I think most of us do the same, um, unless they have a symptomatic infection when they come in, and then it's just kind of like, why did, why did you come in in the first place then? So a patient with a chronic SP tube and a chronically contracted bladder, chronically colonized, you would or would not do them? I wasn't sure I understood that. So, so if, if you have that chronic SP tube patient that is having leakage per the urethra because of the truth from spasms, I'm only, I'm not going to get a urine culture and I'm only going to not inject them double negative maybe, not, not the best fifth grade English, but I'm not going to inject them if they have s signs or symptoms of an active infection at that time. Right. And if not, then I will. So chronically colonized is no problem, it's only if they Correct. are acting febrile that, that, and, and, and then people have shown that in the, the neurogenic literature, yeah. Do you, do you check the, the SP2 people? Are you checking them? Do you do many of those? No. A lot, unfortunately, yeah. Um, and and yeah, we do. Um, again, only if they're symptomatic; otherwise, yeah. we haven't been checking. We're the same. Accidentally, we've all done the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think we've all. I mean, we, I mean, we've all evolved so much in our antibiotic usage, right? I mean, especially those of us that are older, where we were giving way more antibiotics than were ever needed, and realizing we were treating more ourselves than anything the patients needed. So. Same with sacred neural modulation, by the way. I mean, we did a study on what patients were doing, what people were doing, and it was everything from no antibiotics at all to like 10 days of Cipro. I mean, it was all over the board. We give three days of Bactrim. Maybe that's even overkill. I give one answer. I mean, so that's we it. give them, um, so weirdly enough, what? yeah, cephalosporin on the one way answer. to the OR and then three days of, of Bactrim yeah. for, for um, 
what do you call it? What do you call it? The MMRSA. MMRSA. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having these yeah. things. We, we've done the same, but you know, we've been using still Vanco and Gent at stage two, but two I point, like, I don't know. It, it probably is overkill. It's overkill. It's, yeah. I mean, we all know it's overkill. We just don't know what, what you know, what, what the best thing is, but. How little kill we can do. I do, uh, <laughs> I do a so single dose of ANSEP in the operating room, and that's it, and I have never had an infection. I bet you're no. fine, no. yeah. Okay, you and me, one dose ANSEP. All right. Um, so I think the next thing I wanted to talk about was, we're talking a little bit about, you know, what's the biggest reason patients don't want to do botulinum toxin is the risk of retention. And they hear this and they freak out. And I think there's a couple of things that's important in terms of counsel, counseling. Besides talking about the rates and we're going to talk about that, they also have to realize that, you know, I tell patients, if we're going to do this and it works, you're going to be re-injected. We're going to re-inject you about every six to nine months, depending upon, upon how well it works. And I'm not going to put you on, you're not going to, you're not going to do it in six months. You're going to call into my office and tell me when you're ready for another injection and then we'll just get you in. But if you end up needing catheterization, it's not going to last all six to nine months. Usually it's two to four weeks and maybe you have to catheterize once or twice a day and that's it. And you're going to be voiding enough that you don't need to catheterize every time. But if you look at the rate, the need for catheterization, so this is the data from the two studies that led to FDA approval for these drugs, and there were some issues with this. It was half spinal cord injury, half MS patients, and I would, I would venture that a lot of the MS patients we had probably were very close to needing intermittent catheterization before we treated them to begin with. And that's certainly reflected by a 6.7% need for CIC on the placebo arm, right? And we didn't really document when you should start catheterization, as opposed to the OAB trials where it was very much, you're going to start catheterization if you have, I think it was a residual over 250 with symptoms, over 350 without symptoms, or somewhere around there. But if you look at now, a placebo rate is where it should be, essentially zero, and a 6.5% need for catheterization on the overactive bladder arm, I mean the botulinum toxin arm. And if you look at more recent studies looking at the quote-unquote real-world CIC rate, it's less than 3%. And this rate of less than 3% is maintained over multiple injections. Now, the patient that we started this on was a woman with MS with urge incontinence. That's voiding volitionally. And if you're avoiding volitionally, I'm not going to treat you like a neurogenic patient. I'm going to treat you with as an overactive bladder patient. I'm going to give you 100 units. And if you look at this, the, the catheterization rate is certainly a little bit higher at 15% compared to the OAB 100 unit rate of 6%. So, so, so you think about who am I giving 100 units to? Those that volitionally void, low PVR, patients that for, want to do anything they can to avoid CIC, or if they're unable to CIC. And if they're unable to do CIC, the usual response is don't, cath don't do a botulinum toxin injection. But I will also talk to some patients where there's no other option. Like, for example, sometimes with MS patients or Parkinson patients, where I have no other option to give them, I'll tell them we're gonna have two, we're gonna have two, either you're gonna do well or you're gonna be in retention, I can just put an indwelling catheter in. And if you're okay with that, then I can do a botulinum toxin injection therapy, even if you can't see IC. But if you're not okay with an indwelling catheter, we probably shouldn't do this at all because you may be at a higher risk. And who am I gonna get if 200 to those are already on CIC, able to CIC, they want maximum efficacy. So post-injection, I say, patient, I'm gonna see you back in two weeks. It's all about symptoms. Yes, I'm going to get a PVR, but if you come back and your PVR is 400 and you tell me you're doing great, I'm not starting you on CIC because you're doing great. Why am I going to start you on CIC, even though that's what the package insert would suggest we should do? Um, we do know that diabetics have a little bit of a greater risk for CIC. The reality is, so I've kind of changed my follow-up. So someone who I've never, and I don't do this for every injection if someone's doing well, but for a first injection, we've got to follow up in two weeks. So what I tell them is, I'm going to make you an appointment in two weeks. But if in two weeks' time you're doing great and you're super happy, give the office a call. Let's make it a telemedicine appointment. Because what do I care what the PVR is? I'm not going to start you on CIC. You're doing well. You're going to start someone on CIC because their PVR is 300, but now their urgency and frequency is completely resolved. And it's amazing how often that can happen. So I've actually told patients, you can call the office and make it a telemedicine. Have you guys done that at all? 
-hmm. Yeah, and the number doesn't matter as long as they're not having any sequela of, right. of uh, retention. So, so where our patients are concerned, it's kind of a mixed bag, but most studies would suggest that if you're doing your dynamics on the patient's pre-op, especially in men, and they have a higher bladder outlet obstruction index, suggested there may be some degree of obstruction, those are patients that probably aren't going to do well with any of the third tier therapies, in fact, and you may need to address their outlet obstruction first, and if you do a botulinum toxin injection, they may be at greater risk for a retention. It's not surprising, right? I mean, that's what you would expect. Um, the other patients that I, I'm going to go back with not on there, like, you know, if, if I'm going to choose who's more likely to go into retention, someone, a male with clear, with high pressure, low flow, or a male with detrusor underactivity, low pressure, low flow, it's actually the detrusor underactivity patient, in my mind. That patient that has high pressure, low flow, their, their bladder's already working hard, and they're probably going to continue to work hard enough to get, allow them to void. But if they're detru they have detrusor underactivity, that would make me more concerned about going into retention. Um, so who's the right patient, who's the wrong patient? Who's Mr. Right or Mrs. Mr. Right or Mrs. Wrong? So the optimal patient is OAB, urgency, urinary incontinence, urodynamic, the true activity. If you're doing urodynamics for the neurogenic lower tract dysfunction, people that are able to lean to CIC and the neurogenics, although again, with the advent of the MRI compatible, then this is certainly opens up for neurogenics for uh, sacral neuromodulation. What's suboptimal? Somebody who just can't well consider a CIC as KK talked about, anyone that has fecal incontinence, don't waste your time with this. This sacral neuromodulation is really where we should be looking at. If you've got a high PVR baseline or your bladder outlet obstruction, those are folks that probably aren't going to do as well. Um, and just one more thing, you know, so if you have SNS failure, there is some data. It's not great, but there's data that has shown that it does work for folks that have had failure after SNS. The botulinum toxin can help those patients as well. Um, I think that's it. So... Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions that came oh, yeah. in that we haven't really covered. Um, specific to Botox, how do you manage patients who are on anticoagulation? Um, because that's a not a common I, I do not stop it. Okay. Um, I think the one thing that I will do is if you're doing, if someone's bleeding, it's not from the anticoagulation, just you are unlucky enough to hit, put the needle in the wrong spot. And, and what I do is, usually it's mild enough and I just keep going, but if it's one of those ones where you're like, oh, this is going to obscure my view, I'll just stop for a second and hold pressure with the tip of the needle or just the sheath for 30 seconds to a minute, which is the hardest thing for any of us to do because none of us are patient because we're surgeons, but you got to hold it for 30, 30, 60 seconds, and it's very, very rare when that bleeding doesn't just absolutely stop. I don't stop it either, but, um, you know, just on the off chance that there is a little bit of bleeding that's related to the anticoagulation, those are some people that you could consider doing fewer injections to, so you're not sticking right. as many times. Yeah, and I mean, to me, that would, I would worry more about those trigone injections. Yeah, so and I, exactly. I was going to say that I won't inject the trigone, okay. so that's the patient that KK and I would not do the two trigonal <laughs> injections. Um, and then an there was a point. study out of the UK by some friends of ours that uh, basically showed kind of the same thing. So in most cases, you can keep them on anticoagulation. Um, there was another question, okay, here, I'll, maybe I'll direct it to you, which is about sacral neuromodulation. And as we all struggle with the leads that we're trying to remove difficult leads, any tips, tricks that you've done to help uh, assure uh, lead removal without fracture? Yeah. Pull harder? <laughs> no. I think it's important to take the time to, you know, dissect down along the lead. If you can see that first tine, that's optimal. Um, you can grab under the casing there. There's a, like a, a point where there's, where the where the um, lead is connected. But in, in any case, you dissect so, down. So do you always do a cut down when you take the lead out? I do. I do now. I didn't used to. I used to try to pull. Okay. And I try. Do so you? now what I do is I go down oh. on right. You know, I don't right. try to pull it from the pocket. You want to pull from where the percutaneous spot, because we've fractured leads before. So, so and then, speak to how you find the percutaneous spot. Well, so I, I make an incision over the uh, IPG, and then I tug on it, and you can see the skin dimple. Yeah, it just dimples. Yeah, it just dimples. Because if you don't do that, you'll, it's hard to find if you don't get the dimpling. That's exactly right. And, you know, I would I mark it, because once you put your local in there, it, you, your dimple goes away, too. So you put a little mark on there, and then, and then you pull on it, inject some local, make an incision there. Then you go down as far as you can, down onto the lead. And then I take a Kelly, and I basically 
roll it up and I just kind of steady pull. And if you feel it stretching, then you gotta dissect a little bit more. The other thing is if there's somebody who you think it's been in there for a really long time, there is a device where you can actually thread this wire through the lead and it and it kind of, I don't know exactly how it works, it's physics, it kind of crunches up and, and it kind of coils up and you're able to pull, it gives you a little bit more traction on the, the lead from the inside of the lead. So if you're worried that somebody's had an interstitial or a, a sigrunner modulation lead in place for you know, 10 years, you're trying to take it out because you want to go to MRI compatible or something, and you're worried about it being too stuck in there. Because once you start coiling it up on the, on the, you know, start rolling it up on the Kelly, you can't pass that thing through. So you have to make that decision before you start coiling things up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah only other thing I'd add is, you know, I've used it, especially when I'm doing a revision case. Most of us, it, it, the, the kits come preloaded with the curved stylet. So I'll use the straight stylet. I'll put that right down the entire lead. That way it stiffens up the whole thing so it's much more likely to come out. I don't think I've ever broken one coming out that way. Um, if you are just taking a lead out, there is, and if anyone's interested, I'll show you. It's called the EpiMed Epidural Catheter Kit. It's just a cheapy little thing that people uh, in anesthesia use for epidural catheters. Not the, the big expensive kits, just, just a cheap one. And there's a stylet that's exactly the same size as the one that comes preloaded in the neuromodulation kit. So you can use that same way, stiffens up the whole lead so that we can pull it out straight. So, um, so stand up. So, so what do you tell your, so someone does well with botulinum toxin, how do you, how do, you do follow up with those patients? Yeah, I think that's one of the big challenges, you know, because if they're doing well, and we'll do the early initial follow up, maybe two, three weeks, see how they're doing. And, and assuming they're doing well, nothing further. And then we'll typically pre-schedule them for saying, let's come back in six months for a repeat injection. Um, the, the real challenge is if they're doing well at six months, are they gonna just wait or, uh, you know, I think we all struggle with that. We, we actually say we're gonna make an appointment for six months. If you start to feel symptoms before that, you can try to move up. If you get to close to six months and you're doing fine, just bump it out. That way we just don't, drop the ball, you know, we keep track of the patients. So, but we didn't used to do that. Now we know it's about six months is pretty average and so we just make the next appointment for them. So um, we keep them on board. So um, in the interest of time, we're at 10 minutes and so I just wanted uh, Dr. Vasavada to please tell us kind of what the, what the future is, what's on the docket, what's, what's kind of the new stuff coming around and then we'll close right on the minute. <laughs> and while he's doing that, I just want to say thanks because we've done this now for several years and this is by far and away the best Number of engagement and questions we've had. I guess everyone's so happy just to be back in rooms together. You're asking questions. This is great. Yeah, this is it's that. fantastic. Um, I'm just going to talk a few minutes here about some of the new opportunities that have been coming up. This is exciting because we start to think about how are we going to look for the next phase in terms of adding new therapies. Where does it fit in, really? And so I kind of pose this question about a 64-year-old woman who's failed two medications. This is a typical overactive bladder patient. She's um, not interested in the current three refractory overactive bladder options and read on Google, there may be some new options coming. How would you guide her on potential new therapies? And so that's where this new avenue is coming in for different ways to look at neuromodulation specifically. Uh, the StimGuard is an implantable tibial nerve device being looked at investigationally. As I was telling you earlier with the posterior tibial nerve stimulation, the biggest challenge or problem is they have to come in every week for 12 weeks, once a month after that. And that can be very, very cumbersome. And literally, unless someone lives across the street from your office, the ability for them to come in routinely that many times and continually is so, um, so infrequent that at least it gives uh, therapies like this an opportunity. So these are uh, different ways you can implant a lead. It's a wireless system, so externally it'll deliver the charge to it, which will then deliver the continuous-based stimulation to that area of the posterior tibial nerve. There's another one. This one actually just got FDA approved. It's not been actively marketed yet. I wasn't able to stroll down in the exhibit hall to see if they're here or not. But suffice to say, they, I'm sure they will be, if not this year, next year. But think of a, a small coin that got caught in your sock, but instead of in your sock, it's deep inside the skin. <laughs> the uh, placement of this is rather simple. And you, the, you make a small incision and then use a device that basically helps deploy it. This one goes suprafascial, so there's a fascial sheath in our medial portions of our ankle. So this one's gonna go above that and then it continuously, inter I should say intermittently delivers stimulation. So this in and of itself is a, 
uh, implantable pulse generator. And it does very, very infrequently, I think it's every, uh, it's, a, it's every other day, I think that it delivers a little bit of stimulation to that nerve. And so with time, they get the benefits uh, just like you'd get with posterior tibial nerve, except it's delivering it more frequently on a consistent basis. And the data so far has been really pretty good. And then from an ease of use or ease of implantation standpoint, is very easy. And from an ease of use standpoint for the patient, there's nothing more to it. They just really, um, you know, let this thing do its thing while it's while it's implanted. So it's pretty neat in that, and uh, very easy placement for that. Uh, Blue Wind is looking. Oh. Yeah, no, 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 longer. Um, a few years. I believe it's two to three years that it's going to be looking for, and I don't know their label yet, but it's it's definitely not a few months. So this is an implant, and it'll wear out though. To your exact point, after a few years, then has to be replaced. Blue Wind, in a similar fashion is an implantable device in, in that same area. This one's gonna go below the fascia, really adjacent or proximate to the nerve. And then you wear this external stimulator. And the protocols, I think, are reading now every day, but there's other alternative protocols after they get their FDA approval, hopefully, that they'll look at it much more uh, infrequently that you have to put this device, I, I hate to call it like a shackle, but, but it's basically something that goes on the outside of the ankle to deliver the stimulation. And so once it does, does that, it charges it effectively, to, uh, delivers the stimulation to the tibial nerve. And so far, some of the early data that's been presented is actually quite good as well. So just some of the final points, hopefully you all appreciate, you know, with, with different therapeutic approaches, start to categorize the patients you see, um, you know, as to which way you think would be most ideal. As we mentioned, kind of shared decision making, in different ways that we can do that to, uh, to help uh, our patients make the best and, and most informed decision. Right? Yeah, so just in conclusion, I mean, thanks very much. I have a great faculty, so we just, you know, have had a really great time with you guys. You know, this changed a little bit because we have MRI compatibility now, so the only thing is, you know, if you look at the pros and cons of sacral neuromodulation versus on a botulinum toxin, you know, you can kind of see where they're good options for, for different reasons, right? And so when you look at it, for pros for sacral neuromodulation is that the battery life is now in the range of 10 to 15 years, and maybe even more because we're getting so much better about how the precision of our placement of the lead, and so we don't have to turn it up so high to, you know, and drain the battery. Um, no retention um, and global effects on the pelvic floor. I think that's the pros for SNS. For onobotulinum toxin, there's nothing implanted, so that's nice. It's local and anesthetic in the office and, and overall very well tolerated. The cons, of course, is that you have an implanted device. It's the opposite, right, on for sac uh, sacral neuromodulation. Um, it's a two-staged procedure, whether it's surgery or not, there's a two-stage nature to it. And it's not for quote-unquote neurogenic bladder, though we can do it for patients who have overactive bladder symptoms because of a neurologic issue, but just wouldn't label it that way. But now the MRI compatibility is no longer a concern. Um, Botox, again, a risk of uh, uh, retention and risk of UTI, which is probably less than what we used to think it was, and then the durability of the response. But since nothing's implanted, if you just make it kind of get them on the track of coming in every six months or so, patients are quite happy with it. You know, so the take-home message is, is all of you here, it's really great that you've stuck with it for us, you know, with us for two hours here. But, you know, successful options exist, and I think we're all getting better at it, and I think it's worth, you know, the practice and keep learning and keep keep, you know, learning the new tricks as we learn them. I mean, so, you know, I think if you, you know, for those people who tried to do sacral neuromodulation 10 years ago and you didn't feel it was very successful, it's different now, so spread the word. I mean, like, the technology's gotten better and our technique has gotten better and so must we. So with that, I will take the last little questions and, and we want to respect your time. We got three minutes, so please, we'll, we'll skip in the post-test, but I think that you guys, I think that you guys got the answers down. What can we answer for you? I just wanted you? to add one con to the sacral neuro neuromodulator, which is that you can't scuba dive with it. I just found that out. Oh, Can yes. You that's You can't scuba dive below 30 feet. Um, I got in trouble with one of my patient's husbands because of that, because he said, who's going to be my buddy? And she's like, I don't know, but this thing's working, so you've got to find another buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a quick statement and a question about PTNS, uh, tibial nerve stimulation. One of my patients actually um, was coming getting those treatments done and sometime it's perfect sometime it's a little less than perfect yeah. and you know I live in an area where there are about 3,000 PhDs live uh, in uh, southeast uh, Washington state I don't know if everybody is familiar with Hanford project so one time the, it was a perfect placement 
and he told me to just mark it with a skin marking pen. And he went to tattoo shop and got a tattoo done. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, uh, the complicated part of that is that he wanted me to write a prescription so that Medicare reimburses and he gets it paid <laughs> for that. So, well, tattoo, my great. question about PTNS is there was a recent article I read about in AUN News, I think, there were some uh, sexual benefits and, and uh, improvement in sexual performance and enhancement and noted in some of the patients, it's an ongoing study in progress. Any, any knowledge about that? I don't know anything about PTNS. I know that that's also been reported with sacral neuromodulation and some folks are looking at that. I don't know about PTNS specifically, but it, it does, it's not completely far-fetched, really. Yeah, I mean, it, it might, might have some benefits in that. All right, so gift of time. I think we've got two minutes, so we'll give back to you. Thank you for sticking to the very last minute. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great rest of the Thank meeting. You.